Hello, everybody. My name is Alexandre Michy. I'm a cardiologist at Centre Hospitalier de Montluçon in France. I have the pleasure today to introduce and to co-host um, the ISFTH uh, Working Group in Telecardiology webinar called Meet the Authors 2020 ESC Guidelines for the Management of Adult Congenital Heart Disease. We have a very important and special uh, speaker today. But uh, first of all, I would just like to uh, present my co-host uh, uh, for today, uh, Dr. Biliana Parapid from Serbia. Dr. Biliana Parapid is also our uh, sex section chair for uh, women in cardiology um, in our working group. Hi, Biliana, how are you? Hi, Alex, how are you? Doing fine, surging, but doing fine. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, maybe you want to introduce, introduce uh, our special guest? Absolutely. It's or uh, not great... do it. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a great pleasure and even greater privilege for me tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Julie Debaco, who is Associate Professor at Ghent University, of, of course, of Cardiology, and she is uh, the co-chair of the ACHC guidelines. And besides being the global guru of a bunch of us who are aficionados of adult congenital heart disease. Uh, Dr. Tabaka might not know it, but I did my fellowship in France in 2010-2011 exactly at Bicha with Professor Jung, Professor Nataf, who was head of cardi car cardiac surgery, and also Professor Guillaume Jondou, who is running the Marfan uh, National Reference Center in France. So uh, besides uh, my own interest in whatever is uh, adult congenital heart disease, it is a great pleasure to host you tonight, Dr. Baker. We're going to switch to first name basis later, but we're trying to keep it proper, proper, uh, per, per week standards. So um, I allow you to, to share your screen starting from now. We'll, we'll hear Dr. Debaco for like 30 minutes and then we're gonna engage in questions. I invite everyone to send us questions through the chat box and Dr. Debaco, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Mishi and Dr. Parapit for the introduction, for the kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, interesting um, uh, format and this, uh, this webinar uh, where I will be um, addressing the um, um, ESC, so the new 2020 ESC guidelines for the management of uh, adult congenital heart disease. Um, and I will try to to uh, address the the new items in the in the guidelines. Um, first of all, I want to uh, present the task force who uh, have been uh, working uh, doing the, the actual work of uh, of preparing these uh, guidelines with uh, colleagues from from across uh, Europe and one colleague from from Canada. Um, and then. Um, uh, the main message that we uh, have been wanting to bring in this um, in this document, I'm just going. I'm very sorry, but for some reason, my slides move too fast. I'm sorry for that. Um, so um, I don't think that for this audience, I need to to introduce the, um, the, the the format of the guideline documents with the classes of recommendation that are common to all uh, documents uh, where there's uh, class one to uh, uh, class two, two A and two B and class three recommendations going from whether um, statements are recommended or uh, treatments are recommended. Uh, over should be considered, may be considered, and then uh, not recommended uh, for the class three uh, recommendations. And then in addition to the classes of recommendation, we have the levels of evidence where you have, uh, you move from level of evidence A, so big trials supporting the, uh, the, the guideline, uh, level of evidence B uh, with uh, single randomized trials or uh, larger non-randomized trials. And then you have level C, um, where there's consensus opinion of the experts. And um, I don't think it comes as a surprise to you that um, in the setting of uh, adult congenital heart disease, we have very limited uh, big randomized trials in all drug trials and other trials. Um, uh, patients with congenital heart disease are systematically excluded from, from, uh, from uh, those, uh, those trials, which is a pity, uh, but uh, which makes that we, we have very little data to rely on. We had three level of B evidence recommendations and then the big bunch of recommendations in our document is level of evidence C. So based on 
on uh, consensus and expert um, opinion, um, and obviously also from um, retrospective uh, studies and registries. So one of the the biggest and biggest one of the most obvious, let's say, changes in the in the new document when compared to the previous one, which dates back uh, ten years or was two thousand and ten, is the naming of the of the disease, where it has been changed from grown up congenital heart disease to adult congenital heart disease, for obvious reasons. Uh, a grown up is known as an adolescent. Um, yeah, we all know what adolescents are, but uh, we all know also that our population is growing and our population is growing older as well. So there's many people who have reached middle age or even um, moving towards older age. And these can, of course, not be called uh, grown-ups anymore. This is why we changed the naming, which is also in accordance with the name of the European, so the ESC working group, which has also changed from Gooch working group to the ACHD working group. Um, so um, an, another aspect that we found relevant and important to include in the document was uh, a, a listing uh, with a classification of CHD complexity. Um, this is an anatomical classification, as you can see, we choose not to include functional um, um, status in this uh, classification, because you always need to, to look at, at the patient as a whole, so you have the anatomical lesion, but then obviously, as, as is always the case in, in cardiology and clinics, you need to um, add the functional status of your patient to that. And, um, you need to take that into account in, in, in grading your patient as having mild, moderate or severe disease. But I'm not going over this list, um, obviously, for the sake of time, and, and, and this would make the presentation very boring. But this, it, it's a list that will be um, referred to a couple of times throughout the manuscript, and that is useful um, for your uh, reference. Um, and then uh, this brings me to, to the main message of the, um, of the guidelines, uh, which is uh, illustrated in this figure here and where we uh, wanted to show that uh, so congenital heart disease, not only adult congenital heart disease, but the, 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 the whole disease spectrum is um, a lifelong disease. So starting uh, right from birth, but and, and continuing throughout the, the life cycle and um, where you can uh, see in the illustrations that you may have, you may encounter different problems along the way with uh, repeated admissions, repeated surgeries as well. There's um, women with a pregnancy wish that come along. There's the, um, the, the problems related to acquired uh, cardiology that come along with older age. Um, and um, so patients with congenital heart disease should never be regarded as as cured. So so they, they keep some disease uh, throughout their life and they need uh, proper care and follow up throughout their lifetime. Um, and this brings me then to the organization of care. So how should centers, um, expert centers be organized when, um, when they want to um, accommodate these uh, people? And these are the staff requirements that we included in the document. And you can see that it's, it's, this is a very multidisciplinary um, uh, team that is required, not only with cardiologists, with cardiologists from different backgrounds. So there's uh, EP people, there's um, heart failure people, there's intervention cardiologist obviously um, but then in addition to that you also need um, anesthesiologists you obviously need surgeons um, nurses um, pulmonary vascular disease experts geneticists and then uh, the um, important group of psychologists social workers and increasingly important also the palliative care team so you need really um, a multidisciplinary team to um, to take care of uh, of this uh, patient group um, and then, um, in, so the, the document, the guideline document is, is, can be split in two parts, if you like. So there's a general um, part to start with, and then there's a, a part covering or trying to cover most of the, or, or the common lesions in, in uh, ACHD. And in the general part, we start with a diagnostic workup. So what, what is required there? And I want to, throughout this talk, I will, I will just pick some items um, that are new or, or maybe more 
more relevant um, uh, for uh, for this audience. And one item that we decided to add in the diagnostic workup is the the use of biomarkers, which is commonly used in 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 general cardiology, as we all know. But also in ACHD, there's a, an increasing uh, usefulness of um, especially the neurohormones. Uh, but you need to know that the cutoff values may be different from, from those in, in, in acquired cardiology. BNP uh, values can are especially useful for serial follow-up in your, in your patient. So it's very useful to, to uh, have a level at the start where you can follow over time and see, uh, see how, this, uh, how this evolves. Another very important aspect related to ACHD is arrhythmia. So um, arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death are, along with heart failure, one of the important uh, causes of mortality and morbidity. Um, and we have um, uh, added a list of the various arrhythmias that you may encounter, and we made some special recommendations. So here is the, the list. As you can see, um, with the, the various lesions that we encounter in ACHD, and as you can appreciate, um, the whole spectrum of arrhythmia can occur in these patients, uh, supraventricular, ventricular, and uh, bradycardia. Uh, but there's some differences according to the lesion. So you need to be especially careful and, and take the, the different um, anatomical background into account when um, dealing with arrhythmias in these patients. And this is uh, a table that comes in two parts. There's a long list of, of, of lesions, but you can, you can have a look at it in the, in the manuscript if you like. I don't know what is happening here. I'm sorry for that. So um, with regards to therapeutic considerations in, in arrhythmia, uh, as I said, it is very important when you, when you see a patient with arrhythmia that you take the underlying anatomy, so the cause, the mechanism, the previous surgeries, that you take that into account when uh, treating these uh, patients. And as, as I mentioned, the, 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 this requires a multidisciplinary approach. So um, the, the interaction between hemodynamic abnormalities and arrhythmia is very important in this patient group and you really need, need to take the whole picture into account when uh, wanting to treat these uh, problems. Also important because we are dealing with a young population here that you should um, consider early catheter ablation as an alternative to long-term treatment. So you need to bear in mind that if you consider medical treatment that this will be for a very, very long time in these, in these patients. So in symptomatic patients with supraventricular tachycardia, you may um, um, consider early uh, ablation. A special um, entity, and I will come back to that uh, later, is the trilogy of FALO, one of the most common uh, lesions in, in the ACHD population. And there too, you need to um, be very careful when you want to address ventricular tachycardia coming from the RVOT. And um, consider uh, intervening there before you put in a valve or whether um, uh, percutaneously or surgically because you, you will lose access to that region once the valve is in, is in place. Um, another important aspect that we included is, is that of antithrombotic treatment. Uh, so um, here comes the, the importance of the classification where patients with the mild lesions, you can um, consider the jats vasc and the has blood scores in, the, in that patient group as in the, in the general uh, recommendations. But there's some specific um, uh, lesions in ACHD where the, the application of these uh, common scores is, is less obvious and you really need to go for an individualized uh, approach in these, uh, in these patients. A very special group there is the Fontan group, so patients with uh, uh, TCPC um, corrections. Um, there's big di discussion still going on whether all these patients should be on anticoagulants or not. And then the, 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 in that line, and that is for the ACHD population in general, is the discussion of whether NOACs can be uh, safely um, prescribed in these patients. 
Um, they seem to be f uh, safe in some studies in the absence of, of the, the common contraindications that we know for these, uh, for these drugs. But I just want to show you, this is a very recently published study from, our, from my, my co-chairs group in, in Germany, where they looked at uh, anticoagulants in an ACHD uh, cohort. And as you can appreciate from this, uh, from this graph, there's an increasing use of uh, anticoagulants. And in, in pink, you can see the, the, the um, ratio of, of, of NOACs that have been used in this group. But they did some analysis on, on so hazard uh, ratio calculations for all-cause mortality, for bleeding, for thromboembolism, um, and then for, for, major, so for major events. And you can see that, that it, it is not very much in favor of the NOAC. So there's really a need for more data in that, in that field before we can routinely um, prescribe NOACs in this, uh, in this patient group. Another very important aspect with increasing an increasing need in the setting of ACHD is that of advanced care planning. So um, it is very important. We, we, we will follow these patients for, for their lifetime, as I, as, I, as I said, and some patients may have um, a less beneficial life expectancy or may face uh, problems important problems, health problems uh, throughout their lifetime. So it's very important to timely discuss the aspect of advanced care planning with these patients and always in a, in a patient-centered um, uh, setting. And this is um, from a publication that was published on the same day as the guidelines uh, from the working group. And it's a very useful document with very practical tools to guide you in the process of advanced care uh, planning. Now, um, at the end of the, of the general part, we have included um, a, a, a section on, on pregnancy, uh, anticonception and genetic counseling. Obviously, um, patients that we are dealing with, at least the, the women part of them, will at some point have, have a pregnancy wish. And this is uh, something that you need to carefully consider in these patients. And this is also in accordance with the ESC pregnancy uh, guidelines. And on this uh, slide, you can see the uh, uh, class three and class four um, um, situations. So high risk and very high risk for pregnancy. The ones listed on the right here, so the class four, are women in whom pregnancy should actually not be um, considered and uh, where patients should be discouraged to, to, to become uh, pregnant. So these can be difficult discussions uh, and again need to be um, done in a multidisciplinary uh, setting. Um, related to pregnancy, obviously, uh, but this is also applicable to the to our male uh, patients, is the uh, risk of, of recurrence. Um, there's some, obviously, there's some syndromic uh, forms of ACHD, uh, like, for example, um, the VCF, as we all know. But in many cases, um, or most cases, actually, uh, do not have syndromic uh, features. And also in this setting, so the syndromic ones are, um, well, it's not very difficult to counsel them from a genetic perspective, but the, in the other cases, you may need to, uh, to take an, an, um, an increased uh, transmission risk into account, um, which will again vary according to the, uh, to the underlying lesion uh, and will also vary as to whether it's the, the, the man or the woman who wants uh, to have uh, children. And these numbers may be useful in your uh, counseling process. So then we move to the to the second part of the of the document, with the listing of the specific lesions, and uh, we start. Um, well, we, we we went from let's say the more simple lesions to the more complex lesions, and we started with the shunt lesions, and there, uh, what has changed uh, compared to the to the previous document is that we we put more emphasis on the need for invasive measurement of the pulmonary vascular resistance, which is mandatory in uh, the decision making of uh, shunt closure. So in case you have a patient with um, um, a QPQS above 1.5, you need to calculate your PVR. And then according to the wood units that, um, that, that are calculated, you will have a class one indication if it's below three. Um, there's a little bit of a gray zone in those with uh, between uh, three and five. So it's a class uh, 2A for the, for the shunt lesions. And then if you go above five, there's a difference between, um, this is, I don't know, I'm terribly sorry for this 
moving. Um, so between at, um, above five, there's a difference between whether the uh, shunt is uh, pre-tricuspid. So um, the um, um, ASD lesions, where there's a, a class three recommendation if you cannot lower the uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, uh, whereas in the post tricuspid lesions, so the VSDs and the PDAs, you have uh, there is still an indication for closure even when the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance is uh, above five uh, wood units. So what we have also done in the in the new document is um, um, we provided uh, flow charts. Um, I, um, we hope these will be useful for uh, clinical practice, and these are also incorporated in the in the mobile app. So if you go to the mobile app, you will see that you can move uh, easily in these uh, flow charts uh, from, from the app. And this is just, um, I'm just giving this as an example where you can uh, appreciate the management for ventricular septal defect where you need left ventricular volume overload load, and then you uh, can move throughout the, the flow chart and see where there's indications again, based on your wood units, uh, on the pulmonary vascular resistance, um, and, um, and um, uh, there's some other um, aspects that come into account, so, so episodes of, of uh, infective endo endocarditis uh, that you need to take, uh, take into account. And what we also wanted to emphasize in the guidelines is the increased uh, indication and use of uh, catheter interventions and transcatheter closure for VSDs is one of the examples that we wanted to bring where there's increasing uh, indications in these patients that this may be uh, beneficial. So um, we move then to the to the um, lesions of aortic coarctation and recoarctation, and here too um, we emphasized that invasive measurement is important. You need invasive confirmation of the pressure gradient whenever you have indications for an increased gradient on non on the the non-invasive studies. There's a, a strong preference uh, for uh, catheter, uh, so for stenting in, in the adult population. And what is also uh, new is that you should even consider intervention in those patients who are not, who are not hypertensive, um, but who have an increased gradient. Again, this is with the background of that we are dealing with young people that need proper treatment um, early or as early as possible in life to uh, avoid uh, problems related to hypertension. We know that these patients with uh, coarctation can have uh, serious problems related to that. So you, you, you want to um, work in a, in a prophylactic or in a preventive uh, way. So here is the, is the flow chart for, um, for recoarctation. Again, um, with the preference for, for the catheter intervention, you need confirmation of the, um, of the blood pressure with ambulatory uh, blood pressure measurements. And then you can uh, appreciate from the, from the flow chart that you, you will make your decision based on the, on the peak uh, um, gradient, based on the presence or not of, of hypertension, and also based on the anatomy. So um, whether there's um, more or less than 50% narrowing of the, uh, of the aorta on your, on your scan. And you can um, follow the flow chart for uh, uh, taking the decision whether or not to intervene in your uh, specific patient. Then um, we stay in the aorta, but we move to the aortic root now, and we have um, expanded the section on Marfan syndrome and um, um, decided to include uh, heritable thoracic aortic diseases and also bicuspid aortic disease and Turner syndrome. We have included some specific um, genes um, as additional risk factors. So there's uh, genes in the setting of a heritable thoracic aortic disease that confer a higher risk for dissection and that need to take you need to take into account when deciding whether or not to uh, go for prophylactic surgery. And again, in this young patient group, there's a preference for valve sparing aortic root uh, replacement. Um, again, taking the, the young age into account and knowing that uh, um, you want to avoid re-intervention later in life. Um, 
very briefly on Epstein uh, anomaly, uh, what we have uh, included as 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 a as a new or, or as a, as a change to the to the previous recommendation, is that uh, the surgical repair and we all know that it th these are very tricky um, surgical interventions and um, it's uh, highly recommended that this is done by a surgeon with particular experience in uh, in Epstein uh, surgery. And then we come to what I mentioned as, as one of the, the, the more common uh, lesions or more uh, known lesions in, in ACHD being the tetralogy of Fallot in the spectrum of RVOT obstruction. And there we have adjusted the thresholds for intervention. Uh, it's, well, it's, it's actually common sense that um, if you need surgery, you will have a higher threshold for intervention than if you can help your patient with, with, uh, with the percutaneous procedure. So there's a, a, a distinction there. Um, uh, Transcatheter um, uh, procedures are the first uh, choice in the setting of non-native RVOTs. Uh, the volume thresholds for so the RV volume thresholds have been included in the, in the guidelines to guide you in, 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 in um, setting the indications. And I already mentioned mentioned this arrhythmia management has a special uh, part now in the in the document with special recommendations for VT ablation and uh, also for ICD uh, implantation. So uh, uh, we have included some figures in the document and here you can see the common complications that may uh, that you may encounter in patients with tetralogy of, of fallow most commonly obviously the pulmonary valve uh, problems with pulmonary valve regurgitation but uh, there's other uh, problems that may occur, tricuspid regurgitation, um, also aortic um, dilatation with or not with, uh, that, with um, regurgitation as well. And then there's obviously right ventricular dysfunction, but also um, do not forget that these patients may also present with left ventricular dysfunction on the, on the long term. So, and then we move uh, again to, to uh, another uh, group of lesions being the uh, um, uh, transposition uh, group. So there's, as you know, there's, there's, different, there's a difference uh, in these uh, patients who have undergone an atrial switch procedure in, in, uh, in their younger days. So in childhood, this is a procedure that is no longer performed nowadays in, in, in our um, region. Um, but still we see uh, many patients, many adult patients with, uh, with this type of correction where you have an atrial switch. So it's the venous return that has been switched, not the arteries. Um, and there we have um, adjusted the threshold for low ejection fraction to 40%. And we have um, downgraded the uh, level of recommendation for tricuspid intervention because this is again, a tricky intervention, and this has been downgraded from a class one to a class two A in symptomatic uh, patients. So carefully consider and, and take uh, the whole picture again of the patient into account. The arterial switch uh, patients, they have what we call an anatomical repair. Um, and there uh, we included the stenting of pulmonary branches, which may sometimes be um, occluded um, after uh, uh, the procedure. So where the branches are or like, if you like, in, in, in a fork-like manner going over the aorta and may require a stenting. This is mostly needed in childhood. It's, it's rarely uh, needed in, in adult uh, situations. And then we have the special setting of cor um, congenitally corrected uh, transposition. Um, so uh, where both the um, venous return and the, um, uh, the uh, ventricular arterial connections are switched during um, development and in those cases there we have included an indication for biventricular uh, pacing and then this it brings me to the end with well the, the if you like well one of the more severe um, um, lesions uh, in, in uh, adult congenital heart disease. These are patients with single ventricles or other severe lesions where you cannot uh, do a biventricular repair and patients have undergone a Fontan correction, so a total carvopulmonary connection. We have included a list of recommendations now in the, in the document. Um, and well, these, you, you, can, you can see them here. We, I, I'm just mentioning a few of them. Um, if you have a patient with a Fontan correction coming into the emergency room with sustained atrial arrhythmia, 
uh, you don't need to do additional testing or wait uh, uh, much longer because they will poorly tolerate this and you really need to, to, to um, proceed to electrical cardioversion uh, as soon as possible. I mentioned the aspect of anticoagulation in this group. Um, there's, it's still a little bit of a debate whether all patients should be on them or not. It is especially indicated in those case, cases with atrial arrhythmias or obviously in those with documented thrombi. Uh, pregnancy, um, I mentioned the, the pregnancy list already, um, and uh, Fontan patients, if they have any additional complications, so an arrhythmia or a thrombus or, or whatever other uh, complication, they should be counseled against pregnancy. These are high-risk pregnancies, and, and um, patients should be aware of that. Uh, and here, too, the um, indication for cardiac catheterization is emphasized. It's recommended at a low threshold in all patients who... Um, uh, have a, a poorly evolving clinical uh, picture. So you have to measure uh, saturations, uh, pressure, and um, uh, evaluate these patients in the cath lab. Um, in, um, so, so again, electrophysiologic evaluation is, is, is evaluation and treatment obviously is, is, is tricky in these patients, but it, it, it should be uh, done in a proactive way uh, in, in a specialized center. There's the issue of liver uh, dysfunction. Um, these patients are at increased risk for um, liver dysfunction and even for hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, you really need to proactively screen these patients for these uh, problems. Um, there's some cases where um, uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension treatment may be, may be indicated. And then um, there's a selection of patients in whom a closure of a fenestration, so the surgery, the surgeons uh, will often leave a small connection between the, 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 the conduit and, and the atrium. And in some cases, it may be indicated to close that uh, fenestration. So this brings me uh, to the end of, of, of this presentation again with the, with the central illustration, um, uh, emphasizing that, that congenital heart disease is a lifetime disease. Um, it is um, highly recommended that all these patients are seen at least once in an ACHD expert center to determine the, the most appropriate uh, level of care. And then in some cases you can move to, to some format of shared care if you like. Uh, and if indicated uh, conditions that require expert medical attention and where it's needed to refer those patients to expert centers are all those cases where heart failure is present, um, arrhythmias are um, um, important to be evaluated in expert centers, patients with pulmonary hypertension, cyanosis, and um, uh, as I mentioned, those women with a pregnancy wish. Um, I, I, I hope I have made this message clear that the, these lesions or the, the, the lesions in these patients vary very widely um, in complexity. Uh, there's no two patients that you can compare. Uh, they um, all need um, uh, individualized uh, approaches and, and, and uh, they need to be taken care of in a multidisciplinary um, approach. So, and, and with that, I wanna Thank um, Helmut Baumgartner, who was my, my co-chair in this, in, in this uh, process and, and who was uh, an, an expert men mentor and, and very, I very much enjoyed working with him. I wanna thank all the task force members, obviously, and then the reviewers, so um, Sabine uh, Ernst and Magali Ladoseur and the people from the European uh, Heart Team. And I wanna thank you for your attention and for having me here on this, uh, on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you A so year much. later, I still take time to unmute myself. <laughs> So thank you so much. It was an amazing overview. I would to invite everyone from the audience. Uh, not only you can download the text, but you can basically download the PPTX with the guidelines from the ESC website, besides carrying it in your, in your handheld devices. And to give an opportunity to Dr. DeBacher to discuss something, to go from more general to more specific, uh, we are also trying to, to support Go Red for Women initiative all year round beyond the, the heart month in the United States that we all know just finished in February, hence my show. And um, I, I just wanted to touch upon something that I think most likely Dr. DeBacher agrees, but she will share her opinion also, and that is the 
COVID pandemic uh, brought us into the virtual world that has become a curse for everyone else in medicine because we see our patients all day long. We are on call. We try to attend webinars, whether to support colleagues, host them for educational purposes for other colleagues, and we're living Zoom fatigue, of course. But I think that it has also opened a, um, another window of opportunity for our patients, and which is the part of the silver lining of the virtual reality, and that is telecardiology and actually maybe trying to find a framework irrelevant of our respective countries legal framework right now for telemedicine so how do you see it do you see it as an opportunity to provide it for countries in the region who have similar protocols or who are under the ESC umbrellas or yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for that question. I, I, I totally agree with you that that this pandemic has. I mean, there's a, a lot more downsides than 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 positive things about it. But one of the positive things I I I, I do believe is 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 that the reaching out to each other as colleagues, but also to our patients in, in a different way than what we are used to. So the, the, the life interactions um, has, has significantly improved. And I think that the introduction of telemedicine in even in our patient care uh, should be embraced and, and, and we should proceed. We should not discontinue this once we, we, we will have more, more, more options to, to meet each other live again. So I, I think there's two aspects. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the aspect of, of shared care for these patients. And there, I think that the, the tele um, um, opportunities uh, should be um, included in, in, in how, how we consult our colleagues and how, how we interact with each other, not just with, with, with letters of, of our patients, but well, on screen uh, interactions, even with the patient in the consultation, we, we can we can organize that 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 we have joint um, consultations with one on a screen and, and and the other colleague being live. So I think that's that's one one uh, important uh, aspect with with sharing the information and sharing the care for for um, our patients. Another aspect, and and I think. This is also something that is that obviously is regionally different. Like where I live in in, in Belgium, it's, Belgium is is one big town. Uh, we 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 live so close to each other that the pandemic is is taking much advantage of that. But um, it, it, this means that the, the distances we need to travel to go to to the hospital are very 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 limited. Uh, so we 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 do not have these. Um, distance uh, issues, which is the case obviously in bigger countries like in France, uh, uh, it, it, the distances are, are often much, much larger than, than, what, than what we have here. And there too, I, I, I have seen, um, like for example, I, I encountered recently a, a very nice uh, study in the setting of, 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 of Marfan syndrome, where they thought they taught parents to echo their children. I mean, it, it may be be a little bit futur futuristic still, but still it, it, it worked. I mean, not if 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 we could um, introduce techniques like that in our in our clinical practice. I'm not going to say that. I mean, you, you cannot obviously ask family members to to echo a Fontan patient or. But you you actually just uh, touched upon something that I was thinking about. It also offers. We know that people having mental health issues, and in particular, parents of children who underwent complex procedures from their very tender ages, uh, tend sadly to have this very normal anxiety that whatever goes wrong, even if it's completely benign. And I think that it also offers an opportunity to, to calm people who don't exactly need such an ASAP intervention alive. Uh, and telecardiology tools are in general in all our devices are, of course, they cannot do, a, they can do a focus, but they cannot do a perfect uh, echo, as you mentioned, needed for, for full evaluation. But I think it also gives them an opportunity to, to uh, uh, 
to put their minds at ease until they see a cardiologist. And sometimes it's even more important for the parents and the children. Yeah. And all of us who are on call in ER know how, how even when these children are 20 or 25, but you have parents who are 50 or 60 who are fully functional and just simply scared because their child came home and is having palpitations. It's 80, it's sinus rhythm, but doesn't matter. For them, it's the end of the world, which is also very normal. Yeah, yeah, so, obviously, obviously. Yeah, I, I mentioned echo, which is uh, maybe a little bit far-fetched from now, but as, as you say, the arrhythmia devices, um, the, they are really becoming very good. And, and, and I think I, I mentioned arrhythmia is, is a very important um, issue in this patient group. And yeah, it, um, I, I, I'm, I'm positive about that. I, 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 I really believe that these will help us in, in, in providing uh, better care to, uh, to, to our patients, yeah. We got a couple of questions in the question box, but uh, to be HIPAA compliant, since you're also associate editor of Jack, so we don't want to put you in trouble from, <laughs> from, from another perspective, but they're more specific. And one of them says, what about the dilation of the aorta seen patients in with repair TOF, pulmonary atresia? Is there a risk of dissection in pregnant women? So we're back in the good old realm of pregnancy and a difficult way of telling no to patients. Yeah, I, so so that's about dilatation of the of the aorta or the... Or yes. The, yeah, I don't see the, the question. Well, it's in the um, Q&A. It's not in the chat box. They open something else. So, oh, okay. So I'm... I can copy it in the chat box. No, 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 it's, it's fine. But, but I think... Um, Aortic dilatation in the setting of 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 fallow or of, of pulmonary atresia, it, it does occur, um, obviously. So so, but I think that the clinical uh, relevance with respect to dissection, I mean, because um, it's 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 different if we're talking about aortic regurgitation, but um, with regards to dissection, I think the 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 actual risk of 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 a dissection is 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 low. Um, there's been some 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 reports, mainly case reports, but if you if you go closely, if you have a close look at those, these are in aortas that are even above six centimeters, so where no one would 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 even uh, be at ease with with, with that, that kind of diameters. Yeah. But I think in, in in the majority of the cases that the risk for dissection is 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 not is not very high. Um, obviously if you have to counsel someone with a pregnancy wish, you are talking about two lives. And there we always, for, 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 for good reasons, uh, tend to be a, a little bit more careful. Um, and yeah, I mean, if, if the aorta approaches uh, 50 millimeters in, in such cases, then I don't think there, anyone would feel comfortable with, say, giving a green light. I, I think... Of and to link to it, there is also a question from a colleague from India who asks about a patient of his. She's 23 years old now. Two years ago, he did the stenting of a coarctation of the aorta. So now she wants to get pregnant. And mm -hmm. what, is, what is your advice? Mm -hmm. While you ponder on it, I would invite actually all people who were interested in, in this in situations like this to go back to ESC platform. And there was an amazing sh session during our last live meeting in Paris, that was 2019, which sh sadly shares horrible stories, including encouraging stories. So um, I give it back to Dr. Tabakar. So what are we gonna do about this 23 year old? Well, mm -hmm. if, if you underwent stenting of an aortic coarctation and your blood pressure is, is, is under control and there's no uh, residual, um, um, there's no argument for residual gradient, which means that, that, that there's um, the, 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 the difference between the pr pressure in your right arm and your lower uh, limbs is, is less than 20 millimeters of mercury. Then I, I then I, I, I then it's it's fine to get pregnant. There's there's uh, it's it's um, well it will not be the same risk as in the general population, but um, it, it it's it's only a very mildly increased increased risk for for problems. Um, pay a little more care than 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 a woman without these issues to to blood pressure uh, elevations. All women are are prone to that uh, during pregnancy, 
um, and and in, in in this setting, I would be a little a little more more careful. If there's there's you do no harm with measuring the blood pressure once too often. Um, so so um, be careful with, with with the pressure. But if if that is under control, and even if if you need to take uh, blood pressure lowering drugs, even in that case, pregnancy can be um, can be a safe uh, a safe um, option. Alex, back at you. There are a couple of quick questions you wanted to ask. So, thank you, Bidiana. Thank you, Julie. So, there are some questions regarding anticoagulation. What would you recommend, Julie? Um, what kind of uh, anticoagulants? I know that we have huge amount of pathology here, so it's very difficult to individualize for or, or take each disease um, uh, apart. But um, are we still staying on warfarin uh, and uh, uh, yes. K? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's that's an important uh, question. So, so obviously also in these young people, we want, we do not want to impose them um, uh, on 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 the INR um, checks that that you need when you're on warfarin. That's 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 the main reason why we want to uh, where we would like to 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 to, to switch. Um, I think there there are some studies. There's the Note Registry, uh, an international study uh, that has been that have um, uh, published some some of their results, which are favorable. So where uh, patients with congenital heart disease um, do not seem to have a, a worse outcome when put on a NOAC when compared to to to, to the vitamin K antagonist. So I, I think you can you can definitely uh, consider prescribing uh, NOACs in in your patients. Knowing that, yeah, I, I showed you the, the the data from the German registry that, yeah, there's there's a need for for some more confirmation, and as as you say, uh, it's it's it, there's a spectrum of diseases that we are dealing with, and 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 you always need to to um, individualize your approach. If you have a patient with a repaired ASD, for example, who develops atrial fibrillation, which is not uncommon on, 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 on the long term, I, I don't think that there is a contraindication for a NOAC. A Fontan patient is something, yeah, is, is, is a little bit different, I think. Uh, and there, there's, yeah, there's still some debate on, on, on whether these can be put safely on, 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 on NOACs. But again, I think an individualized approach taking into account the underlying anatomy and, and also taking into account the, the patient. Uh, we all know that some patient's compliance is especially in the younger ones, it's, it's not always uh, ideal. And, and in those settings, vitamin K antagonists can become uh, uh, tricky as well. So yeah, individualized, but and, and taking the lesion into account, that would be my, uh, my advice. Yes, thank you. Uh, so um, what about, you know, what should be the standard follow up for a congenital uh, heart patient uh, should we uh, do uh, every uh, a check a check every year uh, with an halter ecg and the stress test and should we add something more i'm talking uh, to you uh, because i'm not um, uh, specialized in cardiac heart disease you know i'm from the outside so uh, this all is very interesting also from my point of view uh, <laughs> i see sometimes uh, 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 congenital heart disease patients and sometimes you know i have to ask for a specialized advice Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I, again, I'm, 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 I'm repeating myself, uh, but uh, here too, the answer is that um, you need to take the, um, the lesion, so the complexity of the disease into account. Um, um, there's a difference between, between patients, for example, if they, they have had a coarctation and it's well under control, there's no blood pressure issues, then, then you can um, easily extend the, the interval for, for checks to, to two years or, or, or even longer and do it in a, in a, in a shared fashion. So where they will, um, again, with, with the Tele medicine, uh, there's another application for blood pressure measurements where they can um, uh, um, send you their, their, their values and, and there's, there's no need to, to, to actually see them every year. 
Um, it's different if you have like Eisenmenger patients or patients with, with a Fontan correction, you really want to see them at least once a year. And some of them, if they, if they develop um, heart failure or, or arrhythmia, then, then it's like in, that's like in, in, in general cardiology where you want to see them on a more, on a more regular basis. Um, with regards to halter monitoring, um, there is no indication to do this on a systematic basis in these patients. It's, it's also um, in, in the symptomatic uh, cases where you want to, uh, to screen them with a halter or in those cases where there's documented um, conduction abnormalities or, or, or arrhythmias where you are aware of. So again, it's, it's a little bit um, an individual, an individual uh, approach. And, and again, I want to emphasize that, that shared care is a valid option in these, uh, in these patients. Um, and, and I think we, need to, we will need to move in that direction um, um, yeah, in, in, in the future because you, you can't expect from the expert centers that they will keep seeing all, all the, the, the patients. And on the other hand, it's, it's good to have um, um, a colleague who follows the patients in, in closer by to where the patients live than, than we are. Uh, it's if, if, if there's an emergency setting, they, they shouldn't uh, get into their car and drive. Well, again, in Belgium, that will not be necessary. But in France, you don't want to see one driving from uh, the south of France to all the way to Paris. I, so, so. I, I fully agree with that because the, our pep pop, patient population is growing by the minute. And our university hospital centers, even when countries are smaller, Serbia has five, but still, it's it's uh, it's cumbersome, and I think that uh, besides the shared decision making that we have to learn our patients, because some of the decisions have to be shared with our patients, and that's also the other portion is the shared care of our patients that need to be standardized and not just issue a referral letter to send someone to a university center for that. Finally, Dr. Becker, we have taken uh, a good portion of your evening tonight. Is there something that you would like to share with us as we've been asking questions all even evening? Is there something you want to ask us back or we, how you see we should be uh, conducting our webinars in the future and, and in this platform? Ooh, um, yeah. I, I, I... This is another positive aspect of the of the pandemic. I, I was, to be honest, in, in in the beginning with these webinars, I was, in, yeah, I was very nervous to 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 do these kind of things because, yeah, you, you noted even now. I, I I don't know why, but my slides for some reason they 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 move. They have personality of their own, like their own. Yeah, or yeah, normal. exactly. <laughs> so so, but now that we are like into into this and and we manage technically uh, everything I, I i think um yeah i've i've come to like those those, those webinars and also what is a very elegant aspect i i don't know if this will be the case with this particular webinar but then you can watch them in in retrospect exactly. so, so that you can go go back and watch them um, when you when you have the time for that, that is so, very 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 convenient. And I think the, the 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 platform that you have here with with the Zoom platform, we we are all familiar with that by now. So I I I, I would encourage you to um, to continue uh, doing this. Um, um, yeah, I, I think we'll be counting on you also as as we are counting on your reviewers, Dr. Ernst and Dr. Ladzo, who are already planned speakers for this year, but they still don't know it yet. So if they review um, this, then then they will know there will be in Zoom trouble with us this year. Yeah, <laughs> thank no, you but, so much. Yeah, I think I think we we need to we need to continue the, the, these formats. But yeah, yeah please uh, let us meet meet a, a, again in, in a normal way as well. Huh? We need to, uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope Alex so. back at you. Yeah. So thank you so much. Maybe uh, one last question with a very with a quick answer, if if you can, Julie. Um, what would be uh, like a, a minimum minimal number of echocardiography? Uh, that could um, specialize a cardiologist into uh, congenital heart disease. You know, like we, we all know uh, general echocardiography, but starting from, from that point where we can, we, when we are able to do a normal echocardiography, 
what would be the the minimal number required of echocardiographies that uh, uh, cardiologists should do in order to to you know to uh, diagnose uh, appropriately uh, congenital heart disease no no it's it's a bit hard to put a number on it but um in your I, opinion, I, it's not a, no 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 but i think given given the broad spectrum of the diseases um where if you really want to 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 be able to do everything then then to put a, a rough number on that i think you will need at least a thousand um echoes um before you can have well, well before you can be confident that 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 you will not miss miss anything because yeah i mean th th there's there's as i mentioned there's so many different uh, diseases with so many different things that can uh, that can go wrong so if you yeah i think a thousand wouldn't be yeah okay I, I will pass the message to to my interns uh, so thank you so much we have to close this session uh, we had around uh, 400 uh, subscribers and uh, a smaller number online but everybody will be able to see the replay uh, tomorrow so thank you so much first of all julie thank you uh, and thank you also biliana uh, this was a great great session i hope to see you again uh, julie uh, in the near future and also as you mentioned it uh in in physical you know uh, person face to face yeah yeah <laughs> with, with, the, with the glass now right we need we need we need a drink but <laughs> next <laughs> time in Kent. <laughs> yeah, oh definitely 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 you're very you're most welcome thank you so much to both of you thank you and have a nice evening Take bye, -bye. Care, thank you bye. Bye, bye bye